you guys can do so much better than that. I, 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 I mean, I, I, so much better than that. Yes. <laughs> All right, this is the best audience ever. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I want to say that it is an honor to be in conversation with you. Thank you. Um, you are the epitome of black excellence. You are, um, yes, give it up, for sure. Um, you are inspiring and empowering, and I am happy to be here to give you your flowers now. And so, well, that's, that's thank really you for everything kind. that you've done for us. Well, um, I wanna say it's an honor to be here at this fabulous library. Oh my gosh, this gorgeous. is amazing. I remember when the old library, remember that? <laughs> Boy, is this, this is amazing. So it's really an honor. So, okay, first, I want you guys to see my tabs. This is your sign to... That she you has need. the galley. <laughs> I have the galley, but this is your sign that you're going to need to buy this book. Um, my first question, you've been silent for so many years. Yes. And I want to know, why now? Why did you choose now to tell your story? Well, this has really been a journey. Um, I was silent for so many years because I was in pain, mm -hmm. a lot of pain. You know, they say that wounds, wounds build wisdom. And so I had to live with so much pain for so long, and I was lonely. Yes. So this has been a journey. This has been a journey about healing, about finding myself again, and what I want you all to get from this book, I hope that in some way I can inspire you all to heal. It's about mental health. Mm -hmm. um, this was a very, I went through a very difficult 30 plus years. Even on the outside, it looked very successful. But what I was, what was happening to me behind the scenes was really painful. Yeah. Yes. Um, I want to. I want to ask you a couple of questions about the title of the book. Yes. Because there's a connection between the title and also the name of your luxury resorts. And right. so, can you talk a little bit about that and how that resonated with you? Yeah. This is this is very interesting. When I decided to leave Washington D.C to really escape mm -hmm. what I was going through. I ended up buying a farm just outside of Middleburg in the Plains, Virginia. Um, when I went to buy the farm, it was not named Salamander. Mm -hmm. And I did not want the name of that farm at all. So I asked who was the owner before that. And it was a man by the name of Bruce Sunlin. Bruce Sunlin was a fighter pilot that was shot down over Nazi-occupied Belgium. And uh, his whole unit was captured and put in a POW camp. He was able to escape. He went across Europe and got into allied territory of France. He fought briefly with the French resistance, and they wanted to give him the code name Salamander. And he says, well, what does that mean? They said, it's the only animal that can walk through fire and still come out alive. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So what had happened, at that period in my life, I was going through a divorce, and I was going through a time where I was trying to heal and figure out what was going on. And I was walking through the fire at that point. And I said, can I have that name? He says, you can do whatever you want. And it's really interesting because I heard from his son just last week, and he says, I am so happy you're keeping my father's legacy alive. Oh, yeah. yeah. And so you talk about um, the trauma and the journey to writing this book. I can't imagine that it would be easy reliving all the pain. And so what was your writing process like and how did you, you know, take care of yourself during this time? Well, I've had a lot of pressure put on me by so many people. They said, Sheila, it's time for you to tell your, your story. Yes. And so I had been working on it in my head and just trying to figure out the process that I was going to do this. And finally, somebody has a phone. Thank you. Thank you. Oh. Um, Kwame Alexander, who is a great African-American poet, I was yes. hosting him at Salamander. And we had all the black 
authors there. There was over a yeah. hundred and some of them. And they wanted to know the story behind me getting that resort up. And so I was telling them about it. And it's really interesting, but Rita Braver came to me. She says, you're going to write your book. We're not letting you off the hook. So her husband, Bob Barnett, is my agent, agent lawyer. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, you're going to have to help me through this process because I'm in so much pain still. I am suffering from post-traumatic stress. Mm -hmm. And um, I said, I've just been through too much, and I just don't think, I mean, even thinking about it, I started shaking. So um, we pitched several publishers, and there were five of them that really wanted me to write the book. But Simon and Schuster gave me the best offer. Okay. But in the meantime, um, I needed someone to help me, and I had interviewed other um, ghost writers. Mm -hmm. And I don't consider the woman that helped me a ghost writer. She really helped me. And I, it was almost like she was like a therapist. Mm -hmm. And she was able to do so much investigation and dig, because everything in that book is what happened. Yes. OK, there's nothing that has been altered, or I've taken theatrical license. We have done all of the research. Everything that's in there is, is the truth, and we made sure that we did that. But it took two years to write this, and we would do it in blocks. She would come and stay. She's from Los Angeles, and she would come and stay with me for two weeks. But as we were writing, she said, you're not healed yet. I would be shaking so much. She says, we got to stop. But it was the questions that she was asking me re helped me resurface and relive everything that I had been through. And when writing the book, I then understood that I had been through more than I even mm -hmm. realized. So I'm just saying, without her, I could not have done this. Yeah. Um, the book you talk about your life being three acts. Right. And act one, the book starts off with your family and your foundation mm -hmm. because you experience learning about resilience at an early age. Right. And so can you talk a little bit about how that prepared you? Because I remember one statement in the book, you spoke to how what happened to your mom that you would never let that happen to you. Right. This is really important. Uh, first of all, my father was one of eight African-American neurosurgeons in the country. They would not let him practice in white hospitals. He could only operate on black patients. So what they did is they moved us every 10 months to different VA hospitals. So I moved 13 times. Mm -hmm. And people would say, well, that's really hard on a young child. Actually, it was kind of a journey. It was fun, you know, because I was in a different city all the time and I got to meet new people. Mm -hmm. That part didn't bother me. And then we settled outside of Chicago in, uh, in Maywood, Illinois, and he became chief of staff at Heinz VA Hospital. And I thought that I was the apple of my father's eye. I mean, he would take me to concerts. We did a lot of things together. My brother hung in there, too. Um, and then one day, he said, I'm leaving. He just up and left. I was so angry, I packed up his stuff and threw it out in the street. <laughs> and what you have to understand, back then in the 50s, women had very few rights. They didn't have their credit cards, they hit, you know, the husband had the bank account. Mm -hmm. um, he wouldn't even pay child support. So my mother went from here in society down to here. Her friends abandoned her. She was alone all of a sudden. And I had to grow up really fast. I had to take over the family. And so what had happened is I um, got a job at J.C. Penney, and I was mopping floors. Mm -hmm. And I worked there. I'd leave school, and I would work until 10 o'clock at night. And I remember coming in, and my brother was yelling, Sheila, get over here quickly. My mother had a total nervous breakdown. She was in convulsions on the floor. And all of a sudden, it hit me. I said, I never want to end up like this. I'm not going to let any man 
have that kind of effect on me. Mm -hmm. Well, let me tell you. <laughs> Well, they say, if wishes were fishes, we'd all have a fry. Yes. Well, let me tell you. <laughs> I fell right back into that same trap, mm -hmm. OK? I knew in my heart and in my head that I did, was not going to end up like her. And then people will say, well, why did you stay in that marriage so long? And that is the reason why. I was trying to prove mm -hmm. that I could hang in there I was going to support my man, mm -hmm. stand by my man. But what had happened, I was being erased. Yes. Mm -hmm. OK, we were building a company together. I was paying the bills. I was um, working really two jobs. I was still teaching the violin, which was the first act of my life, and conducting orchestras, working at Sidwell Friends, acting on the side. I was hustling, yes. flipping real estate trying to keep everything together. Yes. So, and then would be at BT in the morning, you know, work till three o'clock and then start teaching at four until nine o'clock at night. So I worked so hard. And, and there, there's so much in this book. Oh my gosh, yes. There's so much in this book. And you know, it's lessons learned. It's also about business. I mean, mm -hmm. I was flipping real estate so that I could get a house up in Ward 3, because that's where most of my students were. And I had to really, really make sure that I understood the tax laws, because by buying a house on Brandywine Street, I could write off one third of that house. I had to keep very strict records. So I went from making $7,200 at Sidwell Friends to 68000 doing my own business. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And can you talk a little bit about, because I, I learned so much in this book about the violin. Mm -hmm. And your love has kind of always been rooted in music and the arts at right. a really young age. And so I want to, because you sold the violin. Yeah. Well, um, I started playing the violin in the fifth grade. It was a requirement in the District 89 public schools that every student had to take an instrument. And this violin saved my life in many ways. I fell in love with the instrument. I had been taking piano lessons. You know, reading the book, I hated the piano. Because <laughs> I had this teacher who had really bad breath. <laughs> <laughs> and she was always smacking me on the knuckles. <laughs> so make sure you don't have a piano teacher like that. But anyway, I took up the violin. And I just fell in love with the instrument. And I would practice and practice. And by the eighth grade, I remember playing the Boeing Perpetual Motion on stage, getting a standing ovation, continued playing the violin all the way through high school. But what you have to understand, the arts are really the foundation of my life. They have taught me how to be organized. They've taught me how to listen, how to communicate. There was so much that I learned in playing the violin. Um, and I'll tell you what also helped. In my neighborhood, and we all know this, in African-American neighborhoods, especially lower to middle class, you're not talked to about how to take an SAT test, mm -hmm. or PSAT test. I just remember one day they were saying, next Saturday, you got to go take an SAT test. I said, what's an SAT test? I didn't know what it was. I went and took this SAT test. I think I had the lowest scores of everybody in the country. <laughs> I, I just didn't know what I was going to do. And I knew I wanted to go to college. And I was just really puzzled. And there, my orchestra director, she goes, I don't know how this happened. I said, well, you never told me about these exams. I said, I'll never get into the, I wanted to go to the University of Illinois School of Music. She says, you're going to get in. This is important because this was someone that believed in me. With everything that I was going through, trying to keep the family together, she says, we're going to get this done. She drove me down to Champaign, Illinois. I auditioned. They said, you're in. You're so talented that you're going to, they admitted me into the university and on full scholarship. Mm -hmm. So if I hadn't mm -hmm. done that. And this is really interesting because I, that is another point in my life that I'll never forget because I've always been able, because of that situation, I pay it forward with other students. Yes. 
make sure that they go to school. Yeah, because I had that opportunity. Right. And so we're going to move to Act Two. Yes. If you want to know a lot about Act Two, because I'm not going to spend a lot of time in Act Two, Act Two is covering the 33 year marriage. Buy the book and learn more details about uh -huh. Act Two. But however, in Act Two comes BET. Right. Okay. And what I want to know. In this male-dominated business world, we tend to loop women, powerful women, into the conversation as the wife and not the totality of their identity. That's right. And it's always and, the wife of. Right. So if your voice had been valued and heard more, how might BET have been different? Well, we would have had better programming, I can tell you that <laughs> right now. But let me give you, just from the start, the inception of BET and the reason why we even got into the game. And this is very interesting. It's not that we just said we're going to start BET. BET was born during the birth of all of cable. And one thing that we realized, there was not one cable idea that was addressing the African American voice. Mm -hmm. So we were able to take a proposal that a senior citizen wanted to start a senior citizen network. He threw it in the trash. We pulled it out of the trash, took it home. I crossed out senior, put in black. OK, so the proposal had been written. So all I had to do was that. So the next problem was, how are we paying for this? So Bob said, there's a guy, John Malone, who owns all the cable business in the whole country, flew to Denver, gave it to John Malone. He says, this is the best idea since sliced bread. He immediately wrote a check for $500,000. He has been our guardian angel all the way till it was sold to Viacom. BET really never made money, OK? It's like owning a, a, a sports team. You don't make any money till you sell it. So I remember being in Times Square, and I, and I told him, because of everything I was going through and what he was doing, um, we had to sell the company. This could not continue anymore. If things were different, and if I were more, we probably would have still had BET to this day. But I think we squandered an incredible opportunity of really bringing our voice and keeping it in the media the way it should have been. And see, when BET went on the air, people didn't understand. We couldn't keep it on unless we had advertising. Yes. Nobody believed in a black network, not even hair care product companies. We could not get a dime out of anyone. And that's what pays the bill. So we were only on two hours a week was some of the dumbest program you've ever seen in your life. I don't know, how many of you remember P.D. Green? <laughs> remember, we opened with P.D. Green, and he's eating collard greens and pork chops on the air. Mm -hmm. This is how you eat a pork chop. I don't know, like, <laughs> this isn't programming. <laughs> anyway, we got a little bit better. And um, finally, um, we were able to hit the video market. Now, if you remember, MTV would not play no. black videos. No. So that was our break to bring black videos onto BET. Now, there's a plus and a minus to that. Um, and I remember being on the treadmill, and I'm watching Michael Jackson and Paul McCartney on that da, 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 mm -hmm. da, 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 da. And so anyway, I said, this is, this is really great, the art of storytelling through music. It went downhill about seven months later. And what I saw on the screen were young girls. Mm -hmm. You know, <laughs> dancing inappropriately. You know, if you, you turn the sound off, it looked like pornography. I'm sorry. I did not like what I was seeing. It bothered me so much that I decided to do a show called Teen Summit. Yeah. And Teen Summit, yeah. So I pulled that program being together with Jeff Lee, and uh, he and I were able to put this show together. Mm -hmm. 
it lasted 11 years. We yeah. even got a grant from the Kaiser Foundation. People still to this day remember Teen Summit, but it has won every award in the book. And the reason why I wanted to do that was about educating our young people about what they're seeing on the screen. Yeah. It's not that I was against the videos or anything, but I just didn't want our young girls going out in the street and behaving by, from what they saw on the television. Yeah, um, thank you for Teen Summit. You're welcome. Yes, <laughs> yes clap, please clap. Yes. <laughs> Um, there's so many profound moments in the book. Mm -hmm. I, I told you this earlier that um, on my social media platform, I pair books and wine. And so with this book, I would definitely pair it with a bold red a cab or a Merlot. But there were times when I felt like I needed a tequila shot or a whiskey. <laughs> right? And so this particular time, there's a part of the book where you talk about people coming up to you and telling you, not to leave your marriage because what it meant to the black community. Right. And well, I want to know how that impacted you. Um, because, then, you know, of course, you're like this, you're all this role model, this power couple for the black community, but it was hurting you. Yeah, it was a smoke screen, and people knew f full well what was going on out right. there. And it was a case where I kept getting severely depressed because while he was running around having a party with all these women, and, um, and especially this last one, and you'll see that one in the book, um, <laughs> that was the straw that broke the camel's back. Yeah. I mean, it was at the point where I was almost suicidal, but I had two kids that I had to take care of, and I wanted to leave the marriage. I knew this was the time to do it, and they were saying, you cannot leave. You are the king and queen of black media. We look up to you. And I'm like, what are you looking up to? I'm depressed. He's having a party. I mean, yeah. th this is ridiculous. But what has happened, it, made, it held me back even more to make a decision that was going to be good for me. I was becoming a prisoner yeah. in this marriage. And he didn't want me to leave. He wanted to continue to do what he was doing. And I was supposed to continue to do what I was supposed to be doing, being a good mother, supposedly a good God. wife. You talk about and I was, I was alone. I was so lonely. And I was hurting like you would not believe. And so it just got to the point where I said, that's it. Uh, it it's in the book where it was just the last straw. Oh, yes, yes. And I yes. said, look, I'm leaving, and the company's got to be sold, because I was going to get my half. Yes. <laughs> so I remember I was at Times Square in New York, and the ticker tape was going around the uh, Flatiron Building, whatever those buildings are, and it said BET sold to Viacom, Viacom buys BET for $3 billion. I'm like, oh, praise the Lord. <laughs> <laughs> I called my attorney. I said, we're ready. <laughs> we are ready. And so I heard somewhere, because under the subtitle, it says America's first black female billionaire. And I've heard you say you don't like that title. I don't like the title because it puts a target on my back. Mm -hmm. um, because people come to me for the wrong reasons. Yes. I, wanna, I want real friends. Yes. I, I don't want people that are going to take my bottom line, mm -hmm. who just want to eat into my bank account. And I had too many experiences like that. Mm -hmm. yeah. Too many. I noticed that in the common thread, you're always moving. Yes. And I'm not talking about physically. I'm talking about, like, location-wise. I'm talking you are always moving, and it's onward to the next thing. Right. Um, you're not idle, and you're a risk-taker. And so you talk about being a risk-taker and liking challenges, but also balancing insecurities and failing. Yeah, my biggest fear, and even to this day, it's the truth. It's the truth is the fear of failure. Mm -hmm. 
because I had been programmed for 30 plus years in the marriage, being married to a narcissist, mm -hmm. that I was a failure. I failed at everything from losing a child. I felt like I failed. Mm -hmm. I mean, um, I couldn't, I was either too fat, too thin, too light, mm -hmm. not dark enough. You know, I just was always put down. So I've lived in this kind of ingrained in me. But one thing that I have always done was to continue to move forward, to see what the next step, putting my foot out and figuring out what I was going to do next. Yeah. Even once I moved out to the Middleburg area and moved into a town that I was immediately able to understand, this was a town that was dying. Yes. It was dying. And it had been it was living in a bubble. And there were people that moved out there because it was the she-she place of horses and the hunt and everything mm -hmm. like that. But the town itself was on its last leg. And there was things that I could see in even going through the town that needed to get done. One of the first things I did, every time I would come into the town, there was a gun shop called the Powder Horn. And that gun shop had a Confederate flag in the window. And one day, I just called my attorney. I said, we're getting the real estate agent. And he, I said, there's this building that I'm going to buy. He goes, <laughs> <laughs> he says, why do you want to buy it? I said, because I can. Yeah. And uh, I bought the building, took the flag out, renovated the whole place. It's now a wonderful little cafe <laughs> that people eat. It, 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 it just sent a newer message to the town because what I was seeing was hate. It was hatred. Yes. The other thing that I did, my kids were going to the Hill School. They did not have a real arts facility. So I built a performing arts center. And I thought that this was going to ingratiate me mm -hmm. to the town. You know, they're, oh, this is, this is wonderful and everything. So my next step, because I don't like sitting idle, um, and, it, and, and it was just my way of healing and mm -hmm. proving that I, I'm still alive. Um, I, there was a piece of land, 340 acres, that was brought to my attention that belonged to the late Pamela Harriman. And um, I went up on that land, and I knew exactly what I was going to do. This town needed an economic anchor. And that's when I decided to build the resort up there. I um, had this idea, and I held a little party up there, a really beautiful party, to announce to the town that I, was, I bought the land and that I was going to put a resort up there. And they all they thought was the greatest idea. Willard Scott showed up, County Board of Supervisors. The next day, I'm going to Dulles Airport, and on both sides of the road, it said, don't be E.T. Middleburg. Mm. I remember that. Yeah. So I will tell you, this was the nastiest and the worst fight of my life. I thought my marriage was bad. But this was a whole different problem because it was just the racial indignity that I was put through. I had to sit through hearings where people were calling me names and I remember a, I did name the NFL player. That woman, I'm sure Paul Mellon is rolling over in his grave. You know, what are we going to start calling this, Johnsonburg now? I mean, if you had sat through those hearings, and this went on for years, yes. and I had to do this. I walked down the town sidewalk, and this man, I, he'd go, you black bitch. And so um, I had a driver named George, who's a really big guy, and he would lean over to this man, he says, now why would you want to say a thing like that? And he kind of scooted off. But it was just the indignities. My life was threatened, my kids' lives were threatened. I had to bring in a Navy SEAL team that's still with me. Um, the guards, my everything, my resort and my farm, um, because I'm feeling a little bit more comfortable now, now that it's gone forward. 
but this was, it was a rough fight. You'll read about it in the book. Yes. And in the end, I will never forget that night after I was being blasted and blasted, they took a vote. Do you know I won by one vote? <laughs> one vote. Now, I could have given up and walked away, and I remember the mayor of Percival said, look, you can have all the land you want up there, and, and you can build your resort. He says, we're not going to put you through this. But I knew this was the right place because I did a feasibility study, 30 minutes from Dulles Airport, one hour from Washington, D.C. It is now, that town is now the wealthiest historic town in the state of Virginia. <laughs> And those people, oh, it was my idea, you know. Yeah. <laughs> and they're, they're, they're up in there. And I mean, we get all, we get Capitol Hill in there. They have their PAC conferences there, mm -hmm. both sides of the aisle. They use my resort. We have all sorts of celebrities, TV anchors, you name them. Everybody's but, there. But they, they use that resort. And... My whole resort collection has been named the best luxury hotel yes. collection by USA Today. Yes. Um, let's talk about Act Three, because Act Three, you know, you seek refuge in Middleburg, and now you're into Act Three, and Act Three has love. Oh yes. And <laughs> Act Three. I want you to tell them this story. I think I was, I was like literally screaming because you have this play and then years down the line. Yeah. We're gonna give you a sneak peek. Okay, so this is what happened. While I was teaching at Sidwell and I wasn't making any money and I could hardly pay the bills, um, there was the West End Circle Theater that was, you know, right off P Street down, down the way. And the Negro Ensemble Company had come into town, and um, there were only two parts in the play for women. The one woman, Denise Nichols, ended up having to go back to Hollywood. She was doing Room 222. Mm -hmm. And um, there was Betty Howard. And then there was another guy, because of union, whenever a professional anything comes into town, you've got to also hire local. So the other person um, who played the part of Theo was William Newman. So I went down auditioned. I got the part. I played the part of a prostitute. <laughs> it was a fun part. I wasn't doing anything naughty on stage, but my job was to get some information on how to make boot bootleg whiskey from Russell, who was making the whiskey. And, but he wasn't gonna give it to me, the recipe, but what I was doing, you know, I was playing with him on stage. It was a 20 minute part down to, and I was dancing with him on stage singing Sweet Georgia Brown, and I was swinging him around, and I said, oh, come on, Russell, just give me a little bit, come on. <laughs> I get him into the bed, and all of a sudden he starts snoring, and the audience just falls out. And I'm like, and Blue comes in there, you didn't get that information. I'm like, he's sleep. There's nothing else I can do. But anyway, I made a lot of money doing that part. And it helped me, that money, I was able to then flip real estate, buy over in Southwest, flip that. I bought this townhouse, they're still over there, for $5,000. This is, this is, I know, real estate's gone up. <laughs> It was worth maybe 30000 for the whole townhouse. I was able to flip it for 68000 and then was able to buy the house up in Ward 3 for 115000 mm -hmm. But anyway, fast forward, I'm going to get my divorce. And I walk into the courtroom, and I look up at the judge, and I'm like, I think I know this guy. Oh, my gosh. So my lawyer says, Shut up, and let's just get this divorce over with. And so at the end of everything, because the ex never showed up, his lawyer never showed up, so this was a quick divorce. So I, um, 
at the end, I went up to her, I said, Your Honor, by any chance, do you? I said, No, Your Honor, may I approach the bench? And he said, Yes, you may. I said, By any chance, do you remember me? He goes, I kept looking down at the papers. He goes, Oh, yes, I do. <laughs> <laughs> because during intermissions, I would practice my violin and we would talk together. I don't know what the rest of the crew was doing back there in the alley. But anyway, um, so we, you know, we became friends. Mm -hmm. But I never saw him again. Honest to God, I never saw him again. After we closed the play, it was 98 performances. So um, I just took the bull by the horns and I just said, well, maybe someday we can have lunch or something. He says, I would really like that. So I was president of the Washington International Horse Show at the time. And I sent him an invitation to the gala that was at the Cap Sabrina. And I said to William T. Newman, Jr., and guest. I to see if he was going to bring somebody. <laughs> <laughs> and it was, his mother said, I know how you felt about that woman. Long time ago, do not bring anybody. <laughs> and three weeks later, we started going out. Yeah. But the beauty of this man is he went through the therapy with me. Mm -hmm. He really did. He understood what I had been through. He knew more about the man I left than I even knew. You know, as a judge and being with, you know, knowing the police force and everything else. So it was just a question. He said, we're not going to have a relationship till I know you're healed. He says, because I'm not going to live and have you put me through what you've been through. Right. So he went through the therapy with me. He stayed with me. I'm telling you, I would wake up having terror dreams about what I had gone through. And um, then when he felt as though it was time, then he proposed. But I have to tell you, it has been, he, he came at the right time. And for the first time in my life, I feel safe. Yeah. 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 We're gonna um, we're gonna get to the audience questions. I know the audience has questions. I can go on and on, but uh, you know, to close out for our portion, you know, what advice? Because I know people want to know. You know, would you give young girls, um, relationship-wise or business-wise, like yeah. what advice would you give them? Um, this last paragraph in my book, because I wrote it over and over again. And it says, 16 and a half years had passed since my divorce from Bob. Exactly half that time we had been together, I was finally free. If I could go back in time and talk to my younger self, I would tell her this, trust your instincts. Get to know who you are before you give yourself to someone else. Believe that you can find happiness and that you deserve it. You're going to be okay. You're going to be okay. So are we ready for audience questions? Not yet. Oh, okay. No, what? Oh, more for me. Um, hold on. Let me see. We're not ready for audience questions. What else you want to talk about? What else about? do I want to talk about? Oh, I know what I want to talk about. I want to ask you, um, what has it been like for you being in the sports arena? How, breaking into that, because you know it's mostly white, male-dominated. What has it been like that? It's been a ball. I've been having the greatest time. Um, first of all, I think I kind of cracked the code. I it was the first woman. Yes to get into sports ownership. Now, Susan O'Malley, when she was with A. Poland, she was the first president of a sports fan franchise. And Susan O'Malley and I are still friends to this day. I admire her, and um, we've just remained friends. But buying into these teams has been one of the greatest privileges of my life. Mm -hmm. Now, the Wizards have been a lot of fun. The hockey, I'm still trying to get used to. <laughs> but 
But it's really interesting, these hockey players, for some reason I keep running into them. <laughs> they, in the sense, <laughs> this is a little complicated, they, they, they've kind of clung on to me because they love the resort. Yes. <laughs> They've gotten married out there. They see them. I'm in Aspen at one of my other properties. They're up there having another wedding. I was living next door to one of the hockey players. So it's, it's been a lot of fun. But my heart is with my WNBA team. Yeah. 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 I mean, to be able to see these women, how hard they work on such very little money, I mean, the struggles that they go through. I mean, I don't think the public understands the struggles that they go through. I mean, you know, it's, it is about business. We don't have the audience that we should. But all of you out there, you have got to start supporting these women in sports. Yeah. But isn't that the case with most women in business? Because there's a part in the book where you talk about um, entrepreneurship, not, you know, the whole don't bet on Middleburg, but then you're at the bank. Oh, yeah. And... This is important, yeah. You're at the bank with your money in the bank. Yeah, I and got so close to a billion dollars in the bank. Mm -hmm. And um, I think I mentioned the bank in the book. I did, didn't Oh, I? yes, you named yeah, the bank. Bank of New York. <laughs> <laughs> so, you, I go all the way up to New York City I called and made an appointment ahead of time. I said, I got a lot of money in your bank. I need you to help me figure out how I'm going to handle it. I want to diversify it. I want it to continue to grow. So I get up there. They put me in a conference room. The people that I called and wanted to meet with never showed up. This little white girl come in there, and she's spinning around with her little petticoat and all that kind of, she says, what can I do for you? I said, wait, hold up. <laughs> where is, I don't want to mention their names, where is Mr. Hmm and Mr. Hmm Hmm? Were they supposed to show up for this meeting? I said, I called ahead of time. I had an appointment. And I said, don't play with me on this. She says, well, I don't know what, quite what to do. I said, I do know what I'm going to do. <laughs> I pulled out every penny of my money out of that bag. <laughs> they called me for the next month every day to get me to change. I said, no, you ruined it. You don't get a second chance. I said, you've got to start taking women and black women yes. seriously. And that was another lesson I learned, because I will tell you to this day, I even met with my bankers today. I want to know where every penny is. I want to know how to diversify, how to grow it. But this is important. For those of you who are trying to start businesses, the problem is, and it's just like what my mother went through, banks don't believe in us. Mm -hmm. They do not believe in us as on, to want to build a business as entrepreneurs. Even, now I'm going to tell you this, and this is the truth, even when I decided to build that resort, white men out there get other people's money to build their companies. I could not get a loan. I said, I have the assets to back this up. Oh no, you have to prove yourself. I'm like, what more do I have to do? But I had to build the resort. Yes. And five years in, as it's starting to make money, then they're like, oh, well, you're interesting. Yes. You know, <laughs> you know, maybe you know, we'll, we can help you now. I mean, now I've got investors. Yes. But yes. it has taken all this time. Yeah. But I had to really prove myself that the normal person isn't going to have that kind of runway right. to be able to do that. Right. Um, you, I find it very, it's a full circle moment. Salamander, D.C. Yes. It's literally around the corner from your first mm -hmm. home that mm -hmm. you bought. Yeah. That you bought. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yes. Full circle. 
Yeah, this is just a great opportunity. The Mandarin was not doing well, and uh, I was able to get it at a good price. Yeah. <laughs> so, and um, so it's getting ready to go under renovation. I mean, we've started. We're starting. And we'll have uh, a great restaurant in there, Kwame Amawachi's. Yes. Oh, this is a great question. What role did changing your environment play in you succeeding in the three acts of your life? You mean the very, the moving of 13 times? Or I probably, I'm thinking environment moving to Middleburg, leaving DC. But then moving in the three acts, yes, you're right, moving 13 times. So the moving 13 times pre prepared me for moving to Virginia. Oh. I will tell you that because we live from, we went from Pennsylvania all the way down to Louisville, Kentucky, and there's a part in the book where my father did not want me to go to this black school because we had to walk through a cemetery. And I passed off as white. And we, we, we got away with it. This is in Louisville, Kentucky. But your mom couldn't go to the school. My mom couldn't go because she was dark skinned, so they never saw her. But he was adamant that I was not going to go through the cemetery because things happened in that cemetery. Yeah. Yeah. Um, this is another one. At this point in your life, what is your guiding principle or mantra? What is my guiding principle? principle. Mm -hmm. I'm going to say this again. Wounds build wisdom. You've got to understand and embrace adversity. You've got to embrace failure because that is the only way you're going to be able to be successful in life. If your life is too easy mm. and you have not learned how to deal with the downs in life, because that's what makes you stronger. And I'm sitting on this stage and I will tell you this, I don't have any regrets of what I've been through because I wouldn't be on this stage talking to all of you all. What I went through has made me so strong. I mean, really strong. I could take on anyone now. Yeah. Yeah. I really could. So don't think whatever you're going through in life right now, embrace it learn from it, study it, figure out how to move forward. And also in my book, the main theme or character in that book is my mother. Yes. I was there for her at her lowest moment and she was there for me at my lowest moment. And that woman stayed alive until the doors of that resort opened. Mm -hmm. She died two months after the doors opened. And she always said to me, Sheila, you got to get your power back. Yeah. 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 This is it for the questions? Well, yep. Yeah. It has been my honor to be in conversation with you. It's, this book is phenomenal. Thank you. And thank you for sharing your story in your time and in your you're own so, words. You're so welcome. Thank you. Thank you all. Everybody, you can go upstairs and get in line, purchase a book, and make a line for the signing. Thank you very much.